Hey, this is Elliot Fishman, wiping my face. Just ate some tuna, but I brushed my teeth. So, anyway, see you at the small bow. That's our topic for today. I'd like to welcome everybody here. Today's um, Tuesday. Most important announcement is today's Tuesday. That means Wednesday, Thursday, Friday begins our course, our 36th annual CT course in Orlando. Terrific, terrific meeting. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday's President's Day, so you can have a great weekend. The weather's in the 80s, spectacular program. Everything is terrific. Should be great. You can still sign in. Use my name. I'll get you in. Tell them you know me. Um, but in all seriousness, if you're in the area, if you, it's not too late to get a flight southwest. Everyone's flying down there. Um, it's a great environment, great meeting, great hotel with Swan. And we look forward to seeing whoever's registered, uh, all our friends who are registered, seeing you there in just a couple days. So it'll be great. And, and it will, truthfully, uh, sometimes in Florida, the weather, like everywhere, can be variable. And I did look. The low is going to be in the mid to high 60s. The high is going to be in the mid to low 80s. No rain, no snow, no wind, nothing. Okay. So that's good. That's the first announcement. The second thing is, this has nothing to do with the small bowel, but does anyone really care about New Hampshire? I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. Who cares about New Hampshire? I don't even know where it is. It's a little state. I'm sure the people are very nice and everything, but who cares? Why are they making such a big deal about what New Hampshire thinks? Nobody cares about what New Hampshire thinks. If radiology, if we cared about what New Hampshire thinks about CT or MR or ultrasound, we don't care. We don't care. I know there's some great institutions in New Hampshire. For the life of me, I can't remember any of their names. I don't know where they are. I can't even name a city in New Hampshire. I know it's a little funny-looking state that's up really high. It was one of the spelling words when you were a kid you had to learn. But, but let's be honest. The presidential election is really critical. Uh, it determines lots of things that impact us, from the NIH budget to research, the health, the environment. So that's critical. But New Hampshire, everyone's worrying about what, what New Hampshire thinks. I don't care. Anyway, what about the small bowel? And I don't care what New Hampshire thinks about the small bowel. I'm telling you what we think about the small bowel. So small bowel CT, CT enterography, if you're doing a dedicated study, is really an excellent exam across a range and spectrum of diseases. Some of the earliest papers I wrote, some of the earliest papers in C&T in general, were on inflammatory bowel disease, specifically Crohn's disease. Many good articles from Alec Megabo and the group at NYU really early on small bowel tumors, the Mike Federleys, the Brooke Jeffries, all of those guys wrote tremendous articles talking about how CT was really good for early detection of tumors. We know we talk about small bowel tumors that from presentation to detection of six to 18 months. We learned about the difficulty in picking up small bowel tumors that it can be very subtle. People look for obstruction. By the time you see obstruction, tumors typically are larger, or less. maybe it's an intersusception. Uh, we talk about the subtleties. We talk about inflammatory disease. We talk about ischemic bowel, which becomes more important as we have an older population. We talk about things like sprue, particularly in this era where we're talking about uh, malabsorption and patients' dietary issues. So it becomes very, very important. I think those of us from way back when remember small bowel series. It was okay. It took forever to do. You took a lot of overhead films. You did some pressure spots of the duodenum, not the duodenum, of the ileum. We did it. I was at sign that we did pressure spots of duodenum through a lot of pancreatic cancer, and we did the ileum. But that was Dr. Salik, and that's a long time ago and a very, very long study. Okay. Um, so... The, the question always comes down, what's the best way of looking at the small bowel? The key thing to me is small bowel distension. Because if you don't have good distension, you're going to miss things. Also, you need IV contrast. Because many tumors, particularly small tumors like carcinoids, uh, other neuroendocrine tumors, even adenocarcinomas, they do enhance slightly. And you'll see that enhancement with IV contrast. You're not going to see it without so IV is critical, 5 cc's a second, 100 to 120, Omni 350 or Visi 320 works perfectly. We do dual phase imaging when we do dedicated small bowel studies because some tumors, or we can look at the activity based on arterial and venous. We um, talk about thin sections, some sub millimeter sections. We like 0.75 every 0.5. 
and then reconstruct that, and then look at coronals, look at sagittals, look at 3D, look at MIPS, look at volume rendering, and now we're spending some time on cinematic as well. In terms of key things with the vasculature, uh, a good, good injection, SMA, celiac, sagittal views become critical for looking at areas of stenosis, looking for occlusion that you're going to miss only looking at the axial images. We talk about what's the best way of doing it. Now, um, the question is neutral contrast versus, versus positive contrast. So let's talk about neutral. Neutral is water versus volumen. Volumen is expensive. People often get diarrhea. Volumen, I think, has had its day. I don't see people using it as much as they used to. You hear very little about it because, truthfully, it wasn't much better than water. I think that they changed the formula because people were having too many issues with um, the methicillus giving them diarrhea. And when you change the formula, that was really the key thing, right? You have uh, the, the absorption of fluid into the bowel. The problem with water, of course, water is great, distends the stomach, duodenum, and then does a good job in the small bowel. Obviously, when things are obstructed, you have plenty of water and a little more is going to do well. Also, the big challenge in non-obstructed bowel is you just can't wait forever because water gets absorbed. If you wait more than 20 or 30 minutes, it really is, defeats the purpose. So you can't always get great distension. IV is critical for a number of reasons. I mentioned the celiac SMA origin, but also looking at the branching of vessels. We talk about the vasorecta. We talk about hyperenhancement uh, of the bowel, as well as the small vessels with ischemic disease, which can be increased or decreased flow. We talk about Crohn's disease, looking at Crohn's activity based on the vascularity. Um, you know, comb sign is the thing we think about. Also looking at the bowel enhancement, when you have active disease, typically a small bowel is going to enhance, and that works out very, very nicely. We also talk about transitions. You can have bowel obstruction or rule out small bowel obstruction, one of the most common things we do in radiology. CT is really good. Again, axials, it's kind of hard because loops go up and down. Coronals is really good, and maybe some obliques trying to figure out precisely. You want to be very good about looking at transition points. Everything with small bowel is transition. Is it a transition like into the abdominal wall and a hernia? Is it a transition because there's a tumor? Is it a transition because there's adhesions? Is there a transition because there's a stricture? And we're pretty, pretty, pretty good about telling the difference of all of those. Yes, that was Larry David. I know it was Larry David. Episode four was the other night. I did not see it yet, but I heard it's really good. Anyway. Sticking on subject here, um, let me just, uh, Jane Peterson asked about radiation and teriasis with partial obstruction. So the good news is these days we have less issues with radiation because of multiple ports and beam splitting, but it used to be particularly with pelvic radiation for GYN tumors, for example, the patients would get high doses and then they would get bowel, which had often falls into the field, particularly if the patient has had a TH and BSO, with radiation enteritis, the bowel loops are thickened and edematous. They often can be tacked together. Radiation enteritis causes an edema pattern. Um, at times, it can be confused if you're not thinking about it with recurrence. Also, it can be confused in patients who are getting chemo and radiation. Sometimes chemotherapy causes an enteritis, and radiation does it. And I know Ava Zinrak listening across the hall here. And Ava and I wrote an article on radiation enteritis oh too many years ago. Uh, but I think it can present with partial obstruction. Again, it's really the edematous changes. And then you look at the field of where the bowel loop transitions are. And typically the loops are thickened and edematous. And the mesenteric fat is dirty. And often it's like a conglomerate mass. It looks much different than recurrence of tumor. It looks much more different than a routine um, Obstruction, say, due to adhesions or bands, it's really this conglomeration of the uh, the bowel that really is what you can tell. So uh, it is one of the things to think about in the right situation. Again, the pelvis is the most common thing to me. Also, patients who are getting radiation for right little quadrant. Occasionally, I've seen the radiation changes from uh, the fields from a Whipple's post-Whipple's procedure, but that's less common now. Again, the um, opposed fields and everything else that's been developed in radiation oncology really makes the complication significantly less frequent. So that's really the good news for our patients. 
Now, in terms of looking at the cause of a process in bowel, I always try to follow the bowel down looking for transitions. If you see focal dilatation, you got to look and try to figure out why. Is it a tumor? Is it adhesions? Is it inflammation? When there's a loop of bowel that's abnormal, is it a mass or is it a long area? Maybe due to a stricture, be it inflammatory disease, be it due to ischemia. You want to look at the age of the patient. You want to look at the clinical history. Bands from prior surgery are one of the good causes of patients with small bowel obstruction. You also want to be very, very careful in trying to figure out precisely where the obstruction is. Now, another thing I should mention that we speak about, there's a number of talks on CT as us, is about GI bleeding. And GI bleeding can be anywhere, uh, but the lower GI bleed is basically from ligament of trites down. And yes, diverticulitis is a common cause of bleeding, as is occasionally uh, colon tumors, but small bowel pathology, carcinoid tumors, just tumors, adenocarcinoma, inflammatory disease, ischemic disease, uh, reaction to certain chemotherapies, reaction to certain medications, and radiation enteritis are all things that need to be considered in the picture. So clinical history becomes very, very valuable. I do like the coronals for looking at the transition points. So a, a slab 10 millimeters works good back and forth Looking at where the transition is, when you find the transition, then you look harder and harder. Is it a band? Is it a mass? Is it what's going on there? That's really a good thing to do. I also look at the bowel enhancement. Now, people talk about hyperemia or hypovascular appearance of bowel. Early ischemia will be hyper. Late ischemia when the bowel is infarcted will be low density. We also look for pneumatosis in the bowel, that we think about pneumatosis more commonly in the large bowel. We also can see pneumatosis within the small bowel, so that works out very nicely as well. Um, when you look at the image behind me, you can see the small bowel sitting, and you see the colon and the stomach. That's normal anatomy. One thing you want to look at is that the SMA is on the left and the SMB is on the right. If things switch, you have a malrotation, and small bowel malrotation can lead to small bowel volvulus or small bowel obstruction. So you need to really think about that as well. Um, again, we look at this picture and uh, Hannah drew the small bowel, but drew the large bowel and drew the stomach. And that's probably because the truth is when you're looking at small bowel, you look at everything. Sometimes Crohn's, you'll see foci in the small bowel and you'll see in the large bowel. Sometimes ischemia can involve small bowel and large bowel. And again, pathology in duodenum. Is the pathology arising in the duodenum? or is it coming from the gastric antrum and coming across? Those are all things that are indeed very important. Now, let's see, what else can I tell you? Now, there's a number of things. Again, I would go to CT as Us. Our lecture series came out last week, our newest app. There's a bunch of talks on small bowel, and you can see them on CT as Us um, every few, almost every few months, but at least once a year. This probably is a good time to ask questions. If you have any questions, I'll be able to answer them. Some people do ask, what if they miss Facebook Live? Can they ever see it? Well, I would like to say the answer is no, but the answer is yes, because Facebook Live, when we finish, although I'm not live, I'm pseudo-live because Facebook puts you up and it makes believe you're live even when you're sleeping. It's just unbelievable. We also put, um, Lily puts these talks up also on uh, YouTube. So if you're a big YouTube fan and you subscribe to the CTSS channel, You'll see like 2 billion videos we have, but we have a section which has all the Facebook Lives, and that usually goes up today. Some people do ask me also, what about Instagram? And there are many people right now, there are about uh, 1.2 million people watching us on Instagram. The thing about Instagram is you can watch us and we're live, but Instagram doesn't save anything. So the second I press the button, Instagram is gone. Right, Lily? There's nothing on... 24 hours. 24 hours. You have 24 hours. So... Uh, if you wait more than 24 hours, 24 hours is like a day. Like if you wait till tomorrow at 1 o'clock, we're going to be gone. But we're on Facebook and we're on YouTube. So there's many ways to watch us. Now I'm looking. I don't see any questions. I, sometimes I can. it's hard to get questions on uh, Instagram because of the way everything scrolls up. It's easier on Facebook. But if you have questions on Instagram or Facebook, now's the time to ask them. 
I'm looking at a lot of people who, let me see who signed in, a whole mess of people signed in. I don't know many of the people, but uh, let me see what else. Um, other questions. The, the question, when do you use positive, when do you use water? Surely if you're looking for perforation, you see free air, positive contrast is better at determining where the perforation is. Oral omni, you're just not going to have an issue. You're not going to get peritonitis. With water, it's at times hard to see where the uh, perforation is, particularly if it's small. Positive contrast is really good. If you're looking at small bowel, you're thinking about an abscess. Perry Pickard's written just an article in AJR coming out in June. It was just online talking about how those are the cases where you need to use positive. Don't even think about it because interloop abscesses are hard to see anyway. But with a lot of dilated bowel loops, you don't know what's an abscess and what's going to be the bowel. So positive contrast works really well. Even if you only wait like an hour, we also will wait a half an hour or 20 minutes if we want to use positive contrast proximally. Let me see. Someone said, Cabral Xavier sent a request to be in your live video. Yes, we're taking live video requests. We're going to have people standing in the background like a, like flower pots. Um, we find out, here's a question, do you use cinematic rendering for diagnostic purposes or 3D visualization? To me, 3D visualization is a diagnostic purpose. We do use it for planning surgery. We would use it for staging disease. If you look on CTSS, I've posted and I'm working on some new stuff. The small bowel stuff is absolutely incredible. We're looking at ways of trying to figure out disease activity based on the enhancement. The red is fluid, so edema. It's going to be something I think is very exciting. So I think cinematic is really, small bowel is a terrific app. If you go on PubMed, we wrote an article last year. We're doing some more work about that. I think it should come in pretty, pretty, pretty soon. There's a Hers Lily has a Hershey's candy here. So just want to, uh, just to say that of Hershey's, which is up um, in Hershey, Pennsylvania, which is, I don't know, 80 or 90 miles away, if they want to send in some Hershey bars, we'll take them. These are very small. They're pretty tasty. I prefer the ones with almonds, to be honest with you. The crackle, crackle's not bad. Now, what does crackle and Hershey's have to do with small bowel? Absolutely nothing. Anyway, um, that's about uh, it I have for today. I see there's no more questions. Oh, here's one. What's the difference between appendicitis and mucosal? Appendicitis obviously is inflammation. Mucosal is a tumor. It does cause obstruction. So mucosal can present with acute appendicitis because it causes obstruction and inflammation. But sometimes a mucosal, all you see is a dilated appendix. Now mucoseals are typically considered malignancies. Mucoseals can rupture and then you can get pseudomyxoma peritonei with widespread carcinomatosis. If you see an appendix and it's incidental finding and it's focally dilated, particularly its tip, you got to really think about that being a mucosal. Surgeons will laparoscopically remove that. Once it ruptures, you have all sorts of issues. So um, I think that's, you know, very, very important, uh, very important diagnosis. So appendix, normal caliber, then focal dilatation, got to think of mucosal. And again, you want to operate on those electively, not after they rupture. So that indeed becomes very important. And that's a great question. So with that, I'll stop there. I'll thank everybody for their attention. I'm going from here to our studios, literally across the side, other side of the glass, to do recording. We're actually recording some incredible lectures. I'm going to record a, a real brand new lecture on hematuria, three-part lecture. Uh, the good news for me is I'll be doing it probably today or tomorrow. Unfortunately for you guys, it's going to take about three months till we get to it because we really have been working and catching up and being a little bit ahead so we can do other great things. So here's a few more requests. Hello from Chile. My English is very bad. Love this page. Thank you. And um, have a nice day. And maybe we'll stop with that. Have a great day. And uh, with that, um, to all my friends in New Hampshire, have a great day and everywhere else. Bye, guys.